Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spinoff, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trainway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand-dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trainway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. Peters Valley School of Craft provides unique opportunities to explore and develop your fiber arts skills. Learn from experienced instructors and engage with a vibrant community of artists in fully equipped studios. With a focus on traditional techniques and innovative approaches, Peters Valley offers a variety of workshops like creative visible mending, willow trays, and introduction to textiles. Unleash your creativity in our serene setting, a close drive from New York City or Philadelphia. Visit petersvalley.org to start your journey today. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Ann Merrow. Lisa Mitchell and her husband, Greg, bought a farm on Whidbey Island in 2018. Aliento Farm raises some extraordinary fiber animals. Lisa spoke with me after her morning chores. So Lisa, thanks so much for being with me. I'm so glad to be here, Anne. Thanks for having me. I first came across your work when you wrote an article for Spinoff <laughs> about some fairly unusual fiber animals that you have. And I know that you have a couple, but can you tell me about your guanacos? Yeah, we are so privileged to care for a small herd of guanacos here on Whidbey Island in the Pacific Northwest. They are rare, to the, very rare to the United States. They are the most beautiful camelid that I can even just dream of. And we care for them and raise them for their fiber and they're part of our family. <laughs> and a lot of people are probably familiar with alpacas as being the, the sort of new world camelids, new world air quotes camelids. How are guanacos different? So guanacos were the original form of a llama. Before llamas were domesticated and bred, um, we had guanacos and they originated in South America in the sort of the very desolate sort of deserty, hard to live in regions of Peru and Bolivia and Patagonia and just all those places that you think no one would ever want to go. And um, they were in great numbers way, way, way back years and years ago. And then were discovered to have wonderful pelts and were hunted for their pelts as well as really affected by the climate change. And deforestation started to happen and sheep farming started to happen. Their environment began to change and they went higher and higher up into the more even desolate regions until in the 1970s, they were really placed on an endangered list. As a matter of fact, they're still endangered in various regions, specifically in Paraguay. There are less than 20 of them that exist in the wild. But since the 70s, South America has been pretty diligent with making sure that they're protected on preserves and that they do have environments that they can thrive in. And so in some areas, their numbers, in particular in Chile, their numbers have started to come back. And prior to their um, endangered vulnerability, we did import them to the United States. And so zoos had small herds in the 70s. Well, I guess they came in the 60s and then importation was stopped in the 70s. And so our herd actually comes from that genetic line of those 1960s imports to the zoos. They're wild animals. They're not like your regular sheep or your llama or your alpaca, where people have interacted with them for years and years and years, and they have that sort of genetic knowledge of being with people. So it's a really special thing in the United States. It's really hard to get a count of how many guanacos mm -hmm. there are 
because the numbers that I've heard and they sort of change or whatever, it depends on who you talk to, but there are probably about 300 in zoos in the United States. And then on private land, there are probably less than 200. So mm. it's a really, really big privilege to be able to interact with them and feel like we're trying to carry on some of the genetics, although it's difficult because you can imagine the diversity is not here to facilitate right. that. But we're trying to give them a good life and educate people that they're just special, wonderful animals. They're probably the least known. Certainly people know llamas, people know alpacas. I think conservation efforts about vicuñas are well known, but guanacos are kind of the, the least known of the family. Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't know what they were. I, my mm. husband had traveled in South America quite a lot. And so he knew and he said that he had found some guanacos for us to purchase. And I was like, oh, great, that sounds good. But I really didn't even know what I was getting into <laughs> or what he was talking about. Because it's true, they are not known. And when still to this day, when we say the people, yeah, we raise fiber animals, you know, we're the only producers of guanaco fiber in the U US, they say, what's a guanaco? And how do you say that? You know, they don't even know how to pronounce the, the name. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think probably spinners no, a, a tiny bit more than, you know, people who, who work with only finished yarn, but it's still so unusual. Yeah. How did you happen to, how did you come by your herd? How, how did your husband find them? Oh my goodness. So it's a, it's a wonderful story full of, I just think, amazing flow, basically, we decided we were going to change our lives and we, and we were going to go from, we were going to just ditch the whole suburban lifestyle and live with nature. And we both had had full careers and raised a family and all that kind of stuff in, you know, in the concrete city, manicured lawns, all that, you know, the imagery is just really strong for me. And so we found Whidbey Island, which is a very beautiful rural island um, in the Pacific Northwest. And we happened upon an old alpaca farm. Mm. And not even knowing quite what we were going to do, we bought the farm. And so with the farm, you need to put animals on there because that's part of the dream. And so I sent my husband, I was at a writer's retreat and I couldn't go, but I sent my husband to the Dixon Lamb Town Festival in Dixon, yes. California, central, mm -hmm. you know, 110 degrees. And I asked him to research what kind of sheep we were going to raise because this is a fiber farm and you got to know. And I had no, I was a knitter, but I had no idea about the difference between one wool or another or anything about spinning or anything. So I was like, you go figure it out. <laughs> and... And he went and he is a very, you know, great talker. He loves to make friends and he hung out there. And because of his travels in South America, he noticed that there was a woman with a booth who had two guanacos wow. in a pen at her booth. And it was a mother and a baby. And he walked over there and said, that is a guanaco. Why? Are, what are you doing with a guanaco? You know, I only thought that they were in South America or zoos. And it turns out that she was Dana Foss. She was very well known in the Dixon, in the Lambtown area. And it turns out that she had a herd of guanacos in Dixon that had come from this a zoo disbursement in the 1970s. And she and her husband, who actually did also do an article in Spinoff Magazine in, I don't even know, the 80s, I think. It's, it's so fun that I actually have it. But she told my husband, Greg, that she was getting out of the uh, guanaco, even just the fiber um, raising business, because her husband had recently died and it was too much for her to handle. Mm -hmm. And so he stayed there talking to her for hours and before you know it, he's texting me saying, I found some fiber animals for us. They're guanacos and we're going to go meet them when you get back. And I was just like, okay. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. So Dana got out of it when she, I guess, didn't have the kind of help that you have with your husband. These are wild animals. Are they hard to handle? Well, we had no idea. Yes, they're very hard to handle. And now I know this. You go to the farm and 
every farm apparently has a farm ambassador in the form of the friendliest animal that they have on the farm. <laughs> and so she had this lovely guanaco who had been hand raised um, named Arwen by her husband. And I mean, first of all, I fell in love with them for their beauty and their, their just, there's wisdom in their eyes that I hadn't seen in other, other fiber animals, even other livestock. And so I fell in love with them instantly. Their beauty was just breathtaking. And then she showed me how to halter this one female guanaco named Arwen and handed me the lead and said, you can walk around with her. And I was like, okay. And I'd had one experience of dealing with of leading llamas. And so I had didn't know. Um, and I was pretty frightened. But this guanaco, Arwen, was pretty tame. And so that's kind of what we thought. It was like, oh, how fun is that? We can walk our guanacos around and it's going to be all great. And then, and so we made the arrangement that she would sort of teach us how to take care of them and coach us on handling and feeding and shearing and all of that good stuff. And this was prior to our move to Whidbey. So we were preparing to move, had bought the farm, we were preparing. And we were supposed to go every you know week or so and get coached on this. It was, it was a wonderful situation and she was very happy to help. And then she passed away suddenly. Oh, so we were left without anybody to teach us or show us. And we hadn't figured out that Arwen was the only guanaco in that entire herd that you could actually halter and lead. And oh, so we learned by jumping in the hard way and not knowing a thing. Wow. They do not want to have you touch them. They do not want to have you look at them. They don't want you to herd them anywhere. They don't want to come towards you. They are, you know, you think of a, I don't know, gazelle in the zoo and you that's pretty close to what you would encounter if you were to walk up to a guanaco. So through a lots and lots of trial and error and working with a wonderful expert on how to handle camel, it's not necessarily guanacos, llamas, and alpacas. We did learn to how to handle them. They're still really challenging and sometimes scary. And while they are, they are our family, mm -hmm. they are really not our friends. <laughs> And you said that alarming because, of course, the thing that I'm picturing, because I've seen it, is something like a Paco Vicuña. And they're, you know, they're biggish, but it's kind of like the difference between a pony and a horse, right? Well, they are, yes, all of our guanacos are as tall. I'm 5'9", so they're, they meet me at the eye or taller. Wow. Ex except for the babies, obviously. And um, the Paco Vicuñas are, some of them are the size of a big dog. Um, right. So these animals are very powerful and very large, and they're scared. They have their, their wild instincts that are fight or flight mm -hmm. fully intact. They are not tempered like, you know, a sheep might be or a mm -hmm. sweet goat, you know. Right. And to some extent, you probably want to preserve that as part of their character. At the same time, you know, you kind of need to be able to help them. Well, yes, that's very true. And what we found is in raising the babies, there's a fine line between having them understand that we're equals and that we can do things to them and make them participate in certain like vetting or shearing, that kind of thing, versus we're part of the herd where they can no longer be uh, afraid of us and violate our own physical space, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's been difficult because we want, with the babies, we can actually train them not to be afraid of us. Like we, when we enter the pen, they won't scatter, but we don't regularly reach out and touch them or regularly, you know, think that we're going to train them to do an obstacle course or some kind of pet <laughs> activity. Right. You know, it's like there's a respect <laughs> there that has to stay in place for sure. You know, you mentioned shearing and even for sheep, that's quite an undertaking. Mm -hmm. How is it to shear a guanaco? Do you do it yourselves or do you have a professional come and help you? You're shaking your head. We do not do it ourselves. Ooh, it takes a crew. 
And we have learned over the years, we've tried various different things. And we've been lucky to have a shearer who has participated with us in trying different things. The first year we sheared, we just, he treated them like a llama. And uh, we decided that that was too dangerous for the animals and it was too dangerous for the shearing crew. That when you get a llama down or, well, you can shear a llama standing up, alpacas are stretched out with their legs in general. So he sheared the guanacos like you would an alpaca where he stretched them out with hackles on their each leg and, and then, you know, one side and then flip them and the other side so that they're controlled in a safe way so they don't hurt themselves or they don't hurt the shearers. Well, when you do that to an alpaca, once you get them down, they sort of give in. They just mm-hmm. say, okay, I, I can't do anything. And so I'm just going to get this over with. And a guanaco doesn't give in. So they keep fighting. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to get them stretched out in the first place because they have to do that magical shearing flip that is <laughs> unbelievable that shearers can do that all day long. So what we've done subsequently is we have a, a vet on board who does a mild sedation, who basically tells the guanacos to chill. And that helps them not be so inactive, fight or flight. And I also fashioned a very special hood with Velcro under the chin and behind the head so that there's room for their ears and room for the halter. But when you give them lights out, they tend not to see where they can escape. And so they give up the fight much more readily. doesn't mean they, you know, are happy about it. Right. But it's safer for everyone. So that's what we've been doing. And it's pretty okay. We have one male who is... The males seem to be just really much harder to have a relationship with that has even a little bit of trust. And so we have one male that's just a little on the question mark of whether we're going to actually attempt shearing again this year with him. Wow. Now, how many animals are you working with? So we are, we have eight now. Mm -hmm. We've lost several, unfortunately, in this last year. It's been a really hard thing to come back from, but we have eight healthy ones right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you have a, a shearing crew and a vet for only eight animals. These are, it's kind of intensive. You could handle a whole mess of sheep with one person and, and the guanacos. It's like you need a pit crew. You need a pit crew. There's a lot of fight in them. They've got a lot of spirit. Yep. We had a family friend, a large animal vet, who talked about how few camel and veterinarians there are. And so if mm. there's only, if, if there are hundreds rather than thousands or millions of guanacos, I wonder if it's difficult to find the experts that you need uh, or whether you have to learn a lot of this yourself. So we, one of the things we did do before we even got the guanacos was we figured out if there was a vet on the island who mm-hmm. knew about camelids. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad we did that. And it was true. Uh, Dr. Sandy Ferris has held our hand all along the way. And um, while she's 45 minutes away, again, it's a rural area. It's a big island. She has been really dedicated to helping us with medical issues as well as just behavioral issues and consulting with other vets because um, there are questions about what the difference is between raising wild guanacos in captivity, per se, on a farm uh, versus raising llamas. So she has access to other experts and um, had a lot of experience in her residency. So we are super, super fortunate. Yeah. You know, when I think about how llamas are the domesticated cousins, ultimately sort of the descendants of guanacos, and it's because somebody hundreds and hundreds of years ago, picked out the tamest guanacos and bred them into llamas. That's right. But you're almost trying to not do that process. <laughs> you're trying to keep them, you know, have them have them be workable, but maintain the sort of the essence of what the animals are. That's right. That's right. And it's true. You know, there are other people who have one or two guanacos. There are people in New Zealand who use the genetics of guanacos with the llama to get a stronger pack animal more uh, hardy pack animal. But because we want to be stewards of these animals as they are, as well as preserve their fiber, just as it is, you know, we don't want to change them. 
We just want to support them. Yeah. And their fiber is incredibly fine. Was that kind of what drew you to them or was it just part of the package? Well, the agenda was to have a fiber farm. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely the breadcrumb that led us to them. I didn't know about guanaco fiber. I didn't know about any fiber really. And when I found out how special it was, I just mm-hmm. thought it was a good fit because we don't just do normal stuff around here. We, t- we tend to do the oddest, you know, <laughs> most bizarre stuff or unique or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, when we first shared them and I had, you know, their fleeces, I was quite shocked that it wasn't as divine as I thought it would be. Because, you know, they have a double coat. Right. And the so the guard hair has not been bred out of them, obviously, like an alpaca. Mm-hmm. And llamas have guard hair, but sometimes not as coarse. But guanacos have about 50% guard hair and 50% of the downy undercoat, which is really what we want to use as spinners or, you know, in the fiber blending and that kind of thing. So it's like, I didn't even appreciate what it was. It just looked like red hairy mess, you know, that, (laughs) yeah. They come in slightly different colors, is that right? Do they, do they come in more of a red and more of a white or is it more uniform? So there are like four genetic lines and I can't even name them, but the, Mm -hmm. there are darker red guard hair genetic lines and those tend to come from the most southern tip of South America. And then there are sort of a lighter brownish, light brown, caramely guard hair colored that are higher in the north. The thing is, is that the undercoat is all the same. Oh, okay. The babies have a lighter downy undercoat and it also grows in much longer. The mm-hmm. it, w- a baby, do you want to know what a baby guanaco is called? What? A chilenga. Chilenga. Uh Uh-huh, you got it. Yeah, so the chilengas have a lighter downy undercoat that's much Mm -hmm. longer, but then once they become adults, it's it's all the same color. Is there a particular time of year when the guanacos have babies? Like, is it a particular yearly cycle or do you time it? Yeah, we actually time it here in the Pacific Northwest because Mm -hmm. of the cold and weather. So. Guanacos have a gestational period of 11 and a half months. Holy smokes. It's really (laughs) long. And so we usually time it so that they give birth late July, beginning of August, which gives them enough time to get enough fleece, the babies to get enough fleece on them before the winter comes. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So people can watch your Instagram feed for new babies. Are there going to be new babies this year? Yeah, we have two new babies coming. And I'm so excited because one of my favorite mamas is going to give birth this year in end of July. And she's one mama who lets us interact with the babies. And so I'm really looking forward to it. She lets me be a grandma. Oh, nice. Are they singletons? Do they have just one? Always. If it's if it's two, it's not a good sign at all. So there's just one precious, but it's it's like there's this theme of special, rare, everything about the animal. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. You said that you were looking to start a, a fiber farm. Is this sort? Is this basically a hand spinner's flock? Is it mostly producing fiber? It, I can't even imagine the kind of loss that you would have if you tried to put this through a commercial mill. Or am I off base on that? No, you are. Well, that has been a whole learning curve as well. So it is definitely a hand spinner's flock. And the hand spinner who loves guanaco is very, very dedicated to hand processing and very slow, meditative, you know, cherishing each strand of fiber type activity, as right. opposed to someone who's going to get something that's ready made it to, to spin. When I started, I hand dehaired the guanaco, wow. which literally means you sit there and pluck out the guard hairs. I mean, you can take a big chunk of guard hair, but then you have to finally, some people use tweezers even, just remove all the guard hairs. There are 
factory deherring machines that mills have. Not many of them these days, but some of the mills have them. And I have sent the fiber to several different mills to see how that comes out. And we do work with one mill who who does a lovely job because deherring an ounce of guanaco fiber takes, I would say, a, a day. And that's a lot of work. So they dehair it and, and it comes back to me in a cloud form. Mm. And then that can be spun much like cashmere or blended very easily with a fine wool or other fibers to spin. It's interesting that you mentioned blends because I did notice on your site that sometimes you have a fine wool and guanaco blend. And I, I can see how that would be lovely to spin. And I was just wondering how that came about. So that's another part of our fiber farm. So I can tell you that we get about a pound of guanaco fiber once it's been dehaired from one animal. Oh. Okay. That's so, actually more than I thought. <laughs> really? Yeah. Per year, well, right? For a year. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's so, more than I would have thought. Yeah. I mean, it's still precious, but still, I thought you were going to say, I get an I got a pound for my whole flock. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, so we get about a pound. And so, and we have this big farm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have 11 acres. And so I thought, well, we have these guanacos and we're not very getting very much fiber. So what else can we do? And so then I started to learn that people made these special blends. And then I thought, you know, why can't I? I I'll figure out the fine fiber and I'll get animals and then combine everything like I'm making some kind of good wine, you know, and have a luxury blend. So that makes the guanaco go farther. And it mm -hmm. also is lovely to have other animals. For instance, we have pagora goats and they are way friendly and way <laughs> sweet. And they're my babies and I love them. And so it's nice to have animals who have wonderful fiber who love me and will cuddle with me um, that I can actually produce a nice blend. So yeah, we have uh, satin angoras and pagora goats and then the guanacos. And then a good friend of mine said, how can I support you in your fiber endeavor? And I said, well, I need some really fine wool from a mm -hmm. sheep, but I can't grow it here in the Pacific Northwest. It's too wet. And she's in Eugene and she said, well, I'll get you the best merino sheep that I can. And so she keeps merino sheep for us down there, which is part of our blend. So, Oh, that sounds so wonderful. I was going to ask about what it must be like to have animals from a high, arid, you know, high in elevation, closer to the equator, very, very dry. And you are in the Pacific Northwest on an island where it gets rain and is maybe five feet above sea level. <laughs> and I yep. was just curious how, how they like it. They seem to love it. They love mm -hmm. the snow. They dance in the snow. <gasps> um, they whip their heads around and do prancing in the rain. They don't love going out in the rain. They will. They have their barn shelter and they hang out in there quietly chewing their cud. And then they seem pretty resilient in the latest, you know, the heat that we've had up here has been nowhere near what it was like in California, but they seem fine. They're really hardy, hardy animals. Yeah. That's interesting because my impression of the vicuñas is that they're these sort of delicate things that if you look at them cross-eyed, they can't handle it. But the way you're talking about the guanacos, it's kind of that they're, I mean, I suppose in, in temperament, you might use the word fierce, but you said hardy sort of. Mm -hmm. strong, robust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your fiber farm is just full of these very unusual, special kinds of animals. I mean, I know a lot of people who dream of, you know, getting a couple of sheep. And I have heard of a couple people who get a few sheep and realize that those aren't quite, quite their dream sheep. But you've chosen animals that are very specialized. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose pagoras are not quite as specialized in the Pacific Northwest because that is where they came from originally. Yes. Well, in Oregon in, in particular, there are lots mm -hmm. of wonderful pagora breeders in Oregon, not as many up here in Washington. But I mean, I guess there's a thing that you're saying there that I would comment on. It's like, for us, this was, this was a lifestyle change. It was a really conscious, intentional while 
magical in a lot of ways choice that we made. Mm -hmm. And so I think in terms of having a specialized farm, Mm -hmm. that sort of just matches. It wasn't because we wanted a specialized farm. It was because, you know, I wanted to care deeply about each animal and have each animal mean something really important Mm -hmm. and not only in their presence as the animal but in what kind of fiber they provided and so I guess the intentionality goes not only to the life change but sort of how it continues on and when what it looks like so it wasn't just we're going to plug into what it looks like from afar you get a bunch Mm -hmm. of alpacas and then you have an alpaca farm it was more like we fell into these magical guanacos and how can we extend that to be really special, not in terms of the product, but in terms of the experience of having them. And part of the whole idea of the podcast was, wow, we're learning things here that I knew about in life as a therapist, career person in you know, suburbia, Sacramento, California, but it's from a whole different lens. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I I think obsessively about all of the animals and all of the learning and all of the lessons and and all of the parts of the journey that we've been on. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about your previous profession. Um, Mm. I I read that you came from, you know, Northern California, from Sacramento, and that you previously had a therapy practice. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, an art therapist in Sacramento for almost 30 years and loved my job very much. And I traveled around the country teaching other therapists how to use art. And so you know, my philosophy about art as a process, not a product to show art as a healing process, as a way to express feelings, as a way to overcome trauma. All of that really was something that I lived into as a therapist. And it's a lot to have all those years of helping folks overcome things. And I was really ready to transition to something new. Mm-hmm. Burnout is, is a serious thing. And also, I think that idea of I was helping others use their hands, make things, express things through art, paint, clay, all kinds of different media. And it meant that I didn't have a lot of time to do it for myself. And so there was a piece that felt a little bit disingenuous, like I was teaching them and sort of, you know, trying to preach this way of of being but I really wasn't doing it myself. And so that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to jump into the fiber world. Hmm. Yeah. People often talk about fiber craft as being very healing, whether it's some sort of, you know, mindfulness or whether it's connection, but there is an element of making your life better and making you whole that comes with also working with fiber and yarn. I absolutely agree. And I think you know, the thing that makes me think of, so I worked quite closely with the Waldorf School in Sacramento and saw a lot of their teens um, in my practice. And one of the philosophies that the Waldorf folks have is that children need to play with things that are real, wood, earth, grasses, and that when they play things with things that are real instead of plastic, they feel more grounded. And they have more connection with themselves, with the earth, with others. And so I think that's true with fiber. I think that it's a real material. It is not man-made, although there are man-made fibers, obviously. And then when you think about raising the animal and getting that fiber from the animal, there's even another element of process involved in that, that it couldn't be more real than that, you know? Mm. And so I think the grounding that comes with working with real materials and then going through a long process of taking it from that raw state to an actual something garment or, you know, something you're going to keep warm with, 
is not just about the end product, but it's that whole interaction with your hands and the making that I think just enriches us incredibly. It's interesting that you work with the Waldorf School. When I was in Peru, I think this was in 2017, I went to a village, a small city of Pisac, and some of the families didn't want to be part of the public school, which they felt was not respectful of their you know, indigenous Quechua traditions. And so they founded a Waldorf school. They looked yeah. around at different curricula and decided that the style of teaching over the Waldorf school was what they wanted. And so it's kind of that funny connection because, of <clears> course, <throat> they're, you know, in the Andes working with fiber animals. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, I think when I think about it, it's like Waldorf teaches handwork. And I really respect that because where else do we learn that? You know, I learned from my grandmother, our grandmothers t teach us, you know? Mm -hmm. And, right. you know, I think it is, it's like connecting with this sort of primitive part of ourselves that had to use our hands mm -hmm. in order to survive and that we've become so alienated from that process. And I do think that we as a society feel that missing link and it's one of the ways, you know, it's spinners and knitters, fiber artists absolutely connect in that way. And I think it's one of the reasons why crafts and making is such a big deal these days is because people have discovered how good it feels when they reconnect with their hands and the making. Now, raising fiber animals and pursuing fiber arts can sometimes be those parallel professions where <laughs> you do so much of one that you don't necessarily have time for the other. Are you finding that immersing yourself in a fiber life is pushing you more toward getting to do more with your hands, play with yarn more? Absolutely. I have endless curiosity about what I can do with our own animals' fibers, and then it's ex it's like... I don't even want to admit it's just exploded um, to <laughs> breeds of sheep and cross breeds and natural dyeing. And it, I am just having a ball with it all. Mm -hmm. And I will say that Whidbey is an incredible place to experience that because I've never met so many fiber artist experts than live here. I mean, I'm serious. It's just breathtaking. We have a spinning group that meets once a week for four hours, and wow. there are often 10 to 15 spinners in that circle every single wow. week. And, you know, just regular dialogue about the, what we were just talking about, what we're going to grow in our dye gardens this year and various indigo extraction, blah, blah. I mean, it's just on and on. So I find time for it all. It's all worth it. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, Lydia Christensen of Abundant Earth mm -hmm. Fiber is on Whidbey, Chris Bruland from handweaving.net. One of these days, I'm going to go out and talk to Madeline Vanderhoot, who is on Whidbey. So yep. just off the top of my head, it just seems like this fiber nexus. <laughs> it is. Isn't that just so incredible that we didn't know? And here we are plopped in the middle of it all. It's just so fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that a, a pound of guanaco per animal is not very much, but it's probably more than you are spinning in a year. <laughs> Do you produce the fiber to sell as well or to give away? Yes. It's been really wonderful because people who spin our guanaco, and yes, they do buy it from us, feel that same kind of treasured, like, wow, I got something really special. I really want to interact with it and savor it. So we do sell it through our website. And when we do have it, there's a pretty long waiting list. And I do occasional pop-up sales. Um, if I make a bat that's a blended bat with natural dye wool and that kind of thing in it, and it goes out the window pretty quickly. And we also have, we have had a retreat here where people get to learn to spin the guanaco fiber while the guanacos watch from the barn. And that Michael Kelson, who is also in the Pacific Northwest, who is a fabulous spinning teacher, does that. And we're going to have it again this year at the end of August. And, you know, I think it's like if a spinner gets guanaco fiber, they're not just getting fiber, they're getting a whole experience. And so that's how we've been, you know, passing it on to others. 
there's a certain amount of education involved as well, I would imagine. You have to, if people are buying this rather precious fiber, they're probably looking to you a little bit to understand about the animals, but also how do I make the best use of this very precious resource? Exactly. Yeah. Sort of that the my spin-off article about blending and how much to blend and what the optimum ratio of guanaco to other fiber is isn't a good thing to do. I also have little samples of lots of tiny things like wrist cuffs and neck cozies and that kind of thing that people can make from just a little bit of guanaco and then it still feels really warm and cozy and special. And for sure, the whole thing about dehairing it and what does that take and how do you do it? And of course, when people ask me that, I become a therapist and I say, you know, you have to learn to slow down and take your time and treat it as meditation. It's really good for you. And um, a lot of people love that. Yeah. You know, you mentioned this retreat and how people can spin the guanaco while the guanaco watch from the barn. But although I have this image that I could just pop over and play with the guanacos, you have this this life that people want to learn about, but you have to sort of send dispatches, right? It's like, in a way, people have to find a way to experience this vicariously because they can't necessarily come and experience it directly. I mean, you are sort of our window into this world. So... What do you want to make sure that people understand about this rather extraordinary life that you've chosen, this dream that you've set up? Yeah, I mean, I think, what is it, 2% of our population actually live on a farm? Hmm. And then how many of those, that percentage are actually fiber farms? And then, you know, the guanaco part, we already know. But, (laughs) you know, I think that what I try to do on my social media, as well as on my podcast, is describe the kinds of lessons that come from being able to live with nature and the seasons and the animals. Mm -hmm. And that those lessons aren't necessarily only to be had from a farm. You know, you can live them through stories or through pictures. And so... For instance, a lot of the spinners that I started selling the fiber to initially, or even the ones that I didn't sell it to, they would say, I don't want to sit around and de-hair guanaco. I don't have time for that. And I fully, fully understand that. And yet, when they come to the retreat and they sit there at the table for the morning, the better part of a morning, and they have nothing better to do but sit there and pull the, the hairs out of that fleece, they go, oh, this is what you're talking about. This feels so good. I don't have to do anything. I'm not in the rat race. I don't have to think about what my list, you know, is asking me to do. I am just de-hearing this rare, exotic, special fiber, you know? And so if I can inspire other people to work with their hands and slow down, and I can do that through either telling stories about it or giving them my fiber so that they can experience it themselves. I feel like I'm inspiring people to live differently or at least have snippets of experiences where they can, you know, witness life in a different way. I like what you said about being present for de the, <laughs> the fiber because people can experience somewhat through hearing stories, but there's something about actually doing the thing. And the thing could be spinning or weaving or dehairing, but there is a certain element of that experience that you have to live through your fingers. And so hearing a story can lead you toward that, but it has to sort of be completed with the work of your hands. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I think not to get too geeky, but brain (laughs) research, you know, we think about you have you know, words that sort of dictate how you're going to act and what you're going to do or what you're going to change about yourself or your life. And then the actual experience is way different and more lasting and easier to hang on to because it's full of sensory information, not just words. So in your hands, in your experience, in your senses. Yeah. One of the things I've noticed about people who spend a lot of time with animals, the first person I noticed this with was Judith McKenzie, when I was, who is also in the Pacific Northwest. She, true. When you sit with her in a class, she is so completely focused on just the item at hand. And she's uh-huh. just very present there with you. And I, I noticed that people who work with animals often have that in particular. It's something, there's something mm-hmm. about working with the animals that cultivates that. 
I think that's really true. I think because animals don't have a past or a future, mm -hmm. right? That they're only in the present. And so you have to be in the present with them, particularly, well, I don't know. Guanacos ask that of me. Absolutely. I have to watch where they're going and what they're doing when I'm feeding them because I don't need them to startle or accidentally trample me or spit at me, whatever. But I think you're exactly right. Seeing seeing the farm or the world through an animal's eyes is seeing it in the absolute present mm -hmm. moment. And I think that's a really good thing. Well, Lisa, I actually feel pretty serene talking to you, but I also <laughs> feel called, I feel challenged to go spend a little bit of time with my hands and some fiber this morning. Yay, so. that's wonderful. <laughs> Uh, and we'll have a link to your website and blog and your podcast in our show notes. Great. Thank you so much for spending this morning with me. I appreciate it. I love talking to you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you.